At this time of year, the thoughts of Christian people around the world are turned to the birth of Jesus, Messiah, Christ, Emmanuel, King of Kings. There are many names and titles of Jesus found in the Bible, and in each of them there is contained a description or illustration of his life and work. This morning we're going to examine some of those names and gain the lessons to be found in the deeper meanings in Jesus' name. First, let's look at the most familiar name, Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1 is a familiar passage we often hear read at this time of year. Let's read that. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The reference to the words of a prophet at the end of that reading is to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, which reads just as it was quoted in Matthew. Now, at first reading, this passage in Matthew sounds rather odd. The angel says to Joseph, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, that it might be fulfilled, they shall call his name Emmanuel. Why didn't Joseph call his name Emmanuel, like Isaiah had prophesied? Here's where understanding the meaning of names makes everything clear. Bible dictionaries tell us that Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua. The full form of the name Joshua has two parts, Jehoshua or Jehovah Shua, meaning Jehovah saves. Now, later, this name assumed the form Jeshua, which is sometimes pronounced Yeshua, from which came the Greek form Jesus. But the Hebrew origin of the Greek name Jesus literally means Jehovah saves, or God saves. And that name was given to our Lord to describe the mission of his life, to save the people from their sins, as we just read in Matthew 1.21. Now, how about the name Isaiah had prophesied would be given to Jesus, Emmanuel? Once again, understanding the meaning of names makes everything clear. First, a little Hebrew grammar. In Hebrew, the word El, spelled E-L, literally means a mighty one. And it is often used in the Old Testament to refer to God, and sometimes also used to refer to mighty men of earth, human beings who are strong and valorous. The word El was often made part of people's names to include a reference to God. For example, the name Elijah, or el e ya begins with El, and the name Elijah means Jehovah is God. The name Daniel, or Dan-E-L, ends with L and means, God is my judge. Getting back to the name Emmanuel, we see the suffix E-L at the end of that name, which tells us that the word God is part of that name, Emmanuel. Bible dictionaries say that the first Part of that name, Emmanuel, means with us. 
So then the entire name Emmanuel means God with us or God is with us. And indeed, God was with mankind in that he turned his favor toward mankind to bless them when he gave us his only begotten son to become the babe Jesus born on earth, the savior of the world. Thus, that scriptural passage in Matthew chapter 1 is not so confusing when it says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, to fulfill the scripture in Isaiah that says they shall call his name Emmanuel. Both names convey the thought of God sending his son Jesus to be the Savior of the world. But what is the deeper meaning of the name Jesus? What is the deeper significance of Jesus' life and work of salvation to save the people, all mankind, including us, from our sins? What are we saved from? And what are we saved to? And how? If you ask most Christians, they'll say that if we accept Jesus as our Savior, then we are saved from our sins, as the scripture in Matthew 1 said, and we are also saved from an eternity in hell. And we are saved to heaven. Well, here's where we need to turn to other scriptures to help us understand the fundamental Bible teaching of salvation, the purpose of Jesus and the meaning of his name, what it means to be saved. A good first question to ask is, what does the Bible say is the punishment for sin? Is it hell? The Bible answers in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, not hell, death. So now let's reset our questions and get answers from the Bible. A related question to ask then is, why do people grow old and die? Again, the Bible answers in three scriptures, beginning with God's punishment upon Adam in the Garden of Eden, and by extension to all of his descendants, the entire world of mankind, including ourselves. First scripture, Genesis two sixteen and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Our second scripture, Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man, and that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, death as the result of that sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all men have sinned. Well, how is that? Our third scripture, Psalm 51, 5, expresses the inescapability of death. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity as I grew up by the influences around me, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The curse upon Adam is passed on genetically to all of his descendants. From the day each of us was born, we inherited the penalty God imposed upon Adam, death, dying thou shalt die. And that's why everyone grows old and dies. But now let's return to the good news of salvation. We've established what we are saved from, namely death inherited by Adam's disobedience and the punishment upon him. Now the next question to be answered then is, in the concept of salvation, what are we saved to and how? Once again, the Bible answers these questions with three scriptures. Our first scripture is a familiar text to students of the Bible on the subject of salvation. 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 6. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, <clears throat> who will have all men to be saved and to come into a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all 
to be testified in due time. Now that word ransom means a corresponding price. And the Apostle Paul explains how this ransom or corresponding price works in the second of our three scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15.22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And our third scripture completes the lesson of salvation. It's the verse immediately before the one we just read. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since by man, again that's Adam, came death, by man, that's Jesus, came also the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. Again, that is by one man, Adam's sin of disobedience, death came upon him and all mankind. So too by one man Jesus' willing sacrifice of his life on the cross to provide the ransom, the corresponding price for Adam and all mankind, the scales of God's justice were balanced. Mankind was saved from the just penalty of death for sin in Adam to life in Jesus in the resurrection. So now, from the deeper meaning of the name Jesus, we have the whole picture of salvation and its two main features of ransom and resurrection. Two R words. We'll add a third R word a little bit later, but the point is this. Jesus is the Savior of the world, as his name says he would be, because by his ransom sacrifice, his death on the cross, He saved mankind from death to a resurrection to life. And from this understanding of Jesus' name and what salvation really means, we also gain a correct understanding of the nature of man. Specifically, that man is mortal human flesh, which dies. Man does not have an immortal soul, because if man had an immortal soul that could not die, then there would be no need for the resurrection of the dead, that salvation which is so clearly taught in the Bible. But what will this resurrection be like, and when? Let's answer that question by considering another name, or really Five names of Jesus, found in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, a prophecy of Jesus' birth, and another scripture we often hear read or even sung at this time of year in Handel's Messiah, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The first thing to notice about this scripture, and this is important in understanding all scriptures, is... When in time is this scripture talking about? In these verses in Isaiah, that question has two answers. The first part is fairly obvious, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, was fulfilled over 2,000 years ago when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But then, notice, the rest of these two verses fast forward in time to a time yet future of today. How do we know that? Note the change of tense from present, unto us a child is born, present tense, to future tense. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, future tense. Also note that it is apparent to us as you look about us today, that Jesus' government, Jesus' kingdom of peace, which will never end, 
is not yet established with judgment and justice, but when it is. All mankind will say, this is the government we have always wanted, but never had. So let's learn a little bit more about this promised government, this kingdom, from other scriptures. And there is no shortage of scriptures that I could read to help you gain a vision of what that kingdom would be like. Because if I were to ask you, what was the most frequent topic Jesus preached about during his three-and-a-half-year ministry on earth? The correct answer would be the kingdom. Let's look at perhaps one of the most familiar scriptures that demonstrates this. Matthew 6.10, where Jesus taught his disciples and us how to pray. The model prayer includes these words in Matthew 6.10. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice, first of all, that the kingdom is on earth. And when it is fully established, God's will will be done on earth, just as it is, is now done in heaven. God's will has always been for his human children to be happy and live in righteousness and peace with each other. And after this painful learning experience mankind has endured from the time of Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden to today, while God has permitted evil to rule in the kingdom, all will have the opportunity to choose to obey God's laws and principles and live forever if they do. Returning once again to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, in chapter 11, verse 9, Isaiah wrote, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Here, mountain is used as a metaphor, another word for kingdom or government. And notice that the earth, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord, just as the Apostle Paul wrote in that scripture we read earlier. God wills that all men will come into a knowledge of the truth. And Jesus will be mankind's counselor, or teacher of that truth to all in that kingdom. Now, I want to take a moment to consider a scripture that, on first reading, seems to contradict what I've been saying, that salvation means a resurrection to life in God's kingdom on earth. Many sincere Christians believe that this world will be destroyed by fire and that only the true followers of Jesus who have done their very best to live a righteous life, will be saved from destruction by being taken up into heaven. A scripture that we need to examine is John 18.36. Now in the context of John 18.36, Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate to answer the charge that Jesus has committed treason against Caesar by claiming to be king of the Jews. And, of course, such a claim by any Jew would be punishable by death. So Pilate puts the question directly to Jesus in John 18.33, Art thou the king of the Jews? We read Jesus' reply in John 18.36. Jesus answered and said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should be delivered to the Jews, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Now again, at first reading, it might be thought that Jesus is saying, I am indeed a king. You ask me the question, I have no hesitation to answer. I am indeed a king, but my kingdom is not of this world, this planet, this earth. My kingdom is in heaven, and everyone who is with me will be there with me. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Here's where a closer look at the meaning of words helps us gain the correct understanding of this scripture, just as a closer look at the names of Jesus helps us gain a deeper understanding of his life and work. 
The word in Jesus' reply that we want to take a closer look at is world. The Greek word translated into the English word world is cosmos, with a K in the original Greek. Now, cosmos is a Greek word that we are familiar with from our English word cosmos, with a C, which our dictionary defines as the universe as a well-ordered whole. The Greek word cosmos means order. When a woman applies cosmetics from the word cosmos to her face, she is ordering the appearance of her face as she would like it to be. So when Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this cosmos, he was saying, my kingdom is not of this present order of affairs among men on the earth. My kingdom is not of this time. The last part of Jesus' reply to Pilate confirms this explanation of his words. Jesus said, but now is my kingdom not from hence. That is not from this time forward, not henceforth. In other words, Jesus said, I am not establishing my kingdom on earth now. But there is a new world order coming. And when it does, that new world order, that new social order, that new cosmos will be my kingdom. Here on earth. You know, time is an important feature in God's divine plan of the ages. Bible students have long appreciated the chart of the ages, which divides time from the creation of Adam to the ages to come into three scriptural time periods called in the scriptures worlds or orders of things. The world that was in 2 Peter 3.6, the present evil world, Galatians 1.4, and the world to come in Luke 18.30. And in order to understand the truth of God's plan, we must figure out which world, past, present, or future, a scripture we are studying fits into. The Apostle Paul calls this technique rightly dividing the word of truth. In 2 Timothy 2.15, meaning we must know when a scripture applies in God's plan and to whom in order to get the correct understanding of that scripture. And this is a fundamental principle of Bible study. If you want to study the Bible and have it make sense, you must rightly divide the word of truth, the Bible, into the proper time periods and upon the proper group or class of people. Well, before we finish our little digression into the meaning of the word world in the Bible and the importance of time in God's plan, I want to touch on two more scriptures that relate to the comment I made before when I said that many sincere Christians believe that this world, that is the literal earth, will be destroyed by fire in the end times. Because one scripture that seems to say exactly that is 2 Peter 3.12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements melt with a fervent heat. But then we have another scripture that says exactly the opposite, Ecclesiastes 1.4. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. So which is it? Will the heavens be on fire so hot that the earth, the planet, the dirt will melt away? Or will the planet be around forever? How do we harmonize these two seemingly contradictory scriptures? Well, the harmony between them is that one is symbolic and the other is literal. The symbolic scripture is the first one we read in 2 Peter, because the Greek word for elements, which like that other Greek word cosmos, means an orderly arrangement. It is describing the end of the old social order of things in this present evil world, not the end of the planet. The literal scripture is the second one that we read in Ecclesiastes, the earth. And in this scripture, the Hebrew word means the dirt, the planet, will never pass away. Thus, we have the harmony of two seemingly contradictory scriptures and another fundamental principle of Bible study. 
If you want to study the Bible and have it make sense, you must know when a scripture is symbolic and when it is literal, and the symbolic scriptures can never override the literal scriptures and make them say something that is simply not true. Good principle of Bible study to remember. Okay, enough of our digression. Coming back to the names of Jesus in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, imagine in your mind the best possible ruler, head of state, president, king, or prime minister there could ever be. And see if these descriptions of Jesus in these names doesn't exceed even what you could imagine as the perfect ruler of nations and peoples. He will be the world's counselor, instructor, teacher, and guide to give assistance and direction, whereby the billions of resurrected people will be turned to harmony with Jehovah and to the enjoyment of the blessings provided through the ransom. His name, the Mighty God, or Mighty, Mighty One, will be recognized then on earth as well as in heaven. As the heavenly divine being he became after his own resurrection, he will have all the power necessary to not only resurrect mankind, but also to bring to pass justice and righteousness for everyone in his future kingdom on earth. The name Everlasting Father will apply to him then as the life giver of the world, bringing them back to life in the resurrection during the thousand years of his reign. And in all that time, he will be giving life more abundance in mankind, everlasting life to all who will obey him. Therefore, his title, his name, the everlasting father or the father who will give everlasting life to humanity is a most fitting name. All the world of mankind resurrected on the human plane will obtain their right to everlasting life as human beings in an earthly paradise from their Redeemer, who will then be their king. His name, the Prince of Peace, will not apply to him at the beginning of his reign when he will be tearing down the old social order of this present evil world, but true peace will speedily be established and he shall be known as the Prince of Peace, whose reign will be undisputed and uncontested. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. There will be no rebellion, and his kingdom will not pass away. And combining all these names and the future works they reveal to us, his name will be wonderful. The one who will be recognized by all as the embodiment, the expression of divine justice, love, wisdom, and power. That will be the kingdom on earth for which Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. All of these mentions of the coming government upon his shoulders as a kingdom suggests, of course, another name or title of Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Found in 1 Timothy 6.15, speaking of Jesus, it says, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The meaning of this title is fairly straightforward, and this scripture also tells us what the other scriptures have been telling us about Christ's kingdom, namely that it is not yet fully established, but will be in his times. And we believe that time is soon, as we shall examine a little later. I don't know about you, but every time I see or hear that title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, I can't help but hear the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah go through my head. And speaking of that name, Messiah, we'll get to it shortly too, but first I want to discuss another familiar and closely related name of Jesus, Christ. A Bible dictionary gives this as a definition for the name of Christ. One, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, regarded by Christians as fulfilling Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah. And two, the Messiah, or anointed one of God as the subject of Old Testament prophecies. An ordinary dictionary says that Christ comes from the Latin Christus, which in turn comes from the Greek Christos, 
which means anointed. So this name Christ carries the thought of anointed. And we can understand that because we have a few English words derived from Christ which convey the idea of anointing. We speak of babies or even ships being christened with some ceremonious application of a liquid in the manner of anointing. So when we say the compound name Jesus Christ, we are saying Jesus anointed or Jesus the anointed one. So what then is the deeper significance of this name, Jesus anointed or the anointed one? To understand the deeper significance of this name, let's first consider what it meant to be anointed in Bible times. In Old Testament times, a special oil was prepared according to a formula given by God himself in Exodus chapter 30. And this special anointing oil was to be used only to anoint the persons who were to serve as Israel's priests, as well as the furniture and utensils used in the sacrifices that God commanded the nation of Israel to offer. This anointing signified that the ones being anointed were authorized to serve as priests. A different oil was also used to anoint Israel's kings, as sort of an inauguration ceremony to signify the authority of the one being anointed to assume the office of king legitimately. The one doing the anointing was often a prophet whom the people recognized as God's spokesperson and therefore authorized to anoint a king to his office. So then this term, Christ, defined as anointed, has a deeper meaning of authorized by God himself to serve in the capacity or office given to them. Now, the meaning of this name will become more important in a few minutes when I come back to this name, Christ, and expand its significance and relevance to ourselves. But first, I want to connect this name, Christ, to another name of Jesus, which has the same meaning, but from a different language. I mentioned it before, that name is Messiah. Now, the word Messiah comes similarly from a Hebrew term meaning to smear or anoint. So then, Messiah, which was never used in anointing objects, but only in anointing people, is the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek name Christ. Now, since old times, Jews have been looking for the Messiah to come and fulfill all the prophecies that foretold his work of delivering Israel from their oppression as a people and their scattering as a nation. Even today, religious and even non-religious Jews will say something like, when Messiah comes, Israel will prosper and the world will be a better place. So the name Messiah has a connotation of deliverer to the Jews, and this matches nicely with the equivalent name Christ, because ever since Jesus died and was resurrected, Christians have been looking forward to his return, or coming again as mankind's deliverer. So then, the name Messiah is well associated with Jesus' return. Now, Jews in general do not believe that Jesus Christ is their long-awaited Messiah. But when they see the establishment of his kingdom and how it meets and exceeds their grandest expectations of the Messiah, they will. Well, this raises the question, when will Jesus, the Messiah, return and establish his kingdom on earth? Well, the scriptures give us a clue in Acts 3, 20 to 21. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive, or that is to hold back, to retain, how long? Until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now, without going into the detail it deserves, A study of this scripture tells us that Jesus could not return and establish his kingdom on earth until the times of restitution 
or restoration, that's what that word restitution means, of all things. And we are living in those times now. And the restitution or restoration of all things means to restore mankind and the earth to the perfection Adam and Eve enjoyed in the Garden of Eden. Now, what I just said is almost too good to be true, but that's exactly what the Bible promises. And the correct understanding of this Bible doctrine of restitution gives us the answer to another question that has puzzled people for ages, namely, if there is a God, why does he permit such evil in the world? Not just the death and devastation of nature in earthquakes, hurricanes, and tsunamis, but much more so in man's inhumanity to man, most notable and recently in Syria and in Africa. Well, there is indeed a God. And the answer to the question, why does God permit evil, is this. When all mankind is restored to perfection, as was Adam in Eden, then all mankind will be tested individually, just as Adam was. And that test was, obey God's law and live, disobey God's law and die. But in that future test, mankind will have the enormous advantage of the experience with sin and its consequences, which will enable them to choose life through obedience and pass the test. And that's why God has permitted this evil upon the world of mankind for over 6,000 years to give them that experience to prepare them to choose life and live in the kingdom. And this doctrine of restitution now gives us the third R in a trio of precious truths concerning salvation, ransom, restitution, and resurrection. I want to come back now, as I said I would, to revisit the name Christ and expand its significance more directly to you and to me. And our key scripture is Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I love this scripture because it says that there has been a mystery, a secret feature of God's plan of salvation hid for ages. But now God wants you to know that secret. Namely, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But what does that mean? Well, remember that anointing is a symbol of authorization to a work or office, like the priests and the kings of Israel. This scripture tells us that Jesus' close footstep followers can be like he was, anointed or authorized to join him in his kingdom work. That sounds incredible. So don't believe it simply because I just said it, but do believe it because the Bible says it. And here are just four of many scriptures. First, Second Timothy 2.12. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Second, Romans 2.7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing, following Christ in a sacrificial life, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Our third scripture, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty three: For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Our earthly nature, corruptible, will become a heavenly nature, immortal. And fourth, Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Remember that term. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So what this all means is that there are actually two resurrections and therefore two salvations. 
a first resurrection now to a salvation of glory, honor, and immortality in heaven for the very few who truly follow in Jesus' footsteps. But there is also a general resurrection, a general salvation, as we have already seen in the future, on a perfect earth of the rest of mankind to a salvation in God's kingdom of peace. One more insight this doctrine of the two salvations gives us is that it answers the question, why is it taking so long for the kingdom Jesus taught us to pray for to come? Why is it taking so long to establish his kingdom and do all the things his names imply? It has been almost 2,000 years. Well, the answer is, before the general resurrection and earthly salvation can begin, the first resurrection to the heavenly salvation must be complete. Again, don't believe it because I said it. Believe it because Romans 8.19 says so. For the earnest expectation of the creature, and creature here means all mankind, waiteth, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That is the completion of the class of footstep followers of Jesus. All this truth, is embodied in the name Christ, Jesus, the anointed Redeemer, and the anointed class, his footstep followers, who will reign with him as kings and as priests in his kingdom when all the rest of mankind will be blessed in a perfect earth. Well, it's time to summarize what we have said this morning. We have examined several names and titles of Jesus and found in the meaning of those names deeper illustrations of our Savior's teachings, life, and work. In the name Jesus, we see his work of salvation from death to life. The underlying doctrine in this work of salvation is one of the three R's, ransom. Simply put, The ransom is the satisfaction of God's penalty upon Adam and all mankind for Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. Adam forfeited his perfect human life by disobedience to God's clearly stated law, namely obey and live, disobey and die. But Jesus sacrificed his perfect human life on the cross and so ransomed Adam and all mankind as a corresponding price from that penalty of death to be testified, as the scripture put it, or put into effect in due time. In the name's wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, we see the truth of when that due time for the ransom to be testified is. It is in the coming kingdom on earth for which Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. And in that kingdom, the second of our three R's, resurrection, will take place. Everyone who has ever lived since Adam and Eve were created will be raised from death to life by the everlasting father or life giver and taught by that counselor in the peaceful kingdom where none will hurt anyone else. In the name Messiah, we see the return of Jesus when the times of restitution begin. And that process of resurrecting, teaching, and guiding mankind back to the perfection enjoyed by Adam and Eve before sin entered the world is our third R, restitution, which means to restore to a previous state or condition. And in this case, that means restoring mankind to perfect bodies, perfect minds, and perfect characters. And then... After that restitution work is complete, everyone in that kingdom will be equipped and ready to pass the same test that Adam failed, obey and live, disobey and die. But this time, mankind will have the enormous advantage of experience with sin and its consequences, the evil that God has permitted these 6,000 years, which will enable them to choose life through obedience and live forever. In the name Christ, which means anointed and is the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament Messiah, we see Jesus authorized by God to be and to do all the works required to accomplish the salvation of the world of mankind. And more than this, the scriptures tell us there is also an anointed group or class 
of Jesus' true footstep followers who are called to be assistants in that work for mankind in the kingdom. The footstep followers will have a first resurrection in heaven, following which will be the general resurrection for the remainder of mankind on earth. This is the key doctrine of the two salvations, which very few students of the Bible have discovered. Along the way in our learning about Jesus' life, work, and doctrines, we explored three techniques of Bible study, which students of the Bible have long used if you want to know how to study the Bible and have it make sense. The first study technique is to look at the original dictionaries and lexicons which explain and define the Hebrew and Greek words from which our English words are translated. And these lexicons are available in print, as well as online, to give us not only the definitions of those Hebrew and Greek words, but also other English words used to translate them. The second study technique we discussed is to rightly divide the word of truth, that is, to apply every scripture to the same or correct time period, past, present, or future, in which it applies, and also to apply every scripture to its correct group of people. And the third study technique that we discovered or explored is that a seeming contradiction between two scriptures can often be resolved by recognizing that some scriptures are literal and some are symbolic and that the plainly literal statements of scripture must take precedence over the symbolic ones. Also along our way in learning about Jesus' life and work, we have found answers to some important questions such as, Why does everyone grow old and die? Why does God permit evil? And why is it taking so long for God's promised kingdom to come and be fully established on earth? And lastly, along our way in learning about Jesus' life and work, we have gained some key insights into commonly held misconceptions that are not supported by the scriptures. We have seen that there is no hell of torment and that man does not have an immortal soul. Well, I hope you have found our remarks this morning informative, spiritually uplifting, and an aid to your appreciation and understanding of Jesus' life and work, as well as an encouragement to your further Bible study.